the RF Video Shoot Interview Series. Today we're joined by a legend in the business, former WWF Intercontinental Champion of the World. Actually the greatest, right? Well, there you go. You didn't give me what the title deserves. The greatest WWF Intercontinental Champion of all time. There you go. <laughs> As Mean Gene used to say, it, of all time, <laughs> with emphasis on all. You started out in Memphis, uh, WWF, and then, of course, WCW. Yeah. And uh, Independence Japan recently. Yeah. All right. My first question basically would be how you got started in the wrestling business. Well, you know, I get asked that question a lot, and I say it's an extension of childhood. I, I, I never really wanted to grow up. I, I wanted to just play around my whole life. And, but uh, I, I was uh, always into sports and entertainment, and I knew a lot of people. I, I, I see these e Hollywood true stories and things where people talk. They and the, the question always is, when did you decide you were going to be in the movies, or when did you decide you're going to be a baseball player, football player? And, and I, I decided and I knew by the time I was third or fourth grade in school that I was going to be in pro sports or entertainment somehow. And I ended up in, in, in the best of both worlds. I got sports entertainment wrestling. Right. Who uh, basically trained you? Herb Welch. Herb Welch trained my, uh, myself and uh, my training partner back then was Coco Beware. Uh, Herb Welch was uh, of the famous wrestling Welch family that owned the Florida and Georgia and uh, Tennessee wrestling territories. In fact, his nephew is uh, Robert Fuller or Tennessee Lee in the WWF right. or Colonel Rob Parker in the WCW. That was uh, Herb Welch's nephew, so I was trained by the Fullers and the Welches. Were you a big fan growing up watching the business? or Some, uh, not a lot because uh, we only got three stations out where I lived and the, the station that had wrestling was kind of fuzzy on Saturday mornings, but yeah, in the days of Jackie Fargo and Don Fargo and, you know, the medics and the interns and the Von Bronners and the guys that were all around the, uh, in the Nashville, Memphis area, uh, I started watching wrestling, I think I was probably 12, in my teens, 13, 14. Right. And when you first got into the ring, like, what was your conception about the business? I mean, did you say, hey, I'm over my head or this is what I want to do? No, I trained for nine months straight. To, we were two nights a week, Coco and I trained, and uh, in fact, one of the, uh, another guy that went through that, that particular scoop, a couple of them, uh, Carl Fergie, uh, Larry Latham, who became Spot Moondog and at one time was my partner in Memphis, and Dr. D. David Schultz, uh, the guy that slapped at ABC 2020, John Stossel right. guy, they all went through the school the year before me. But uh, no, I, I, I was always in sports, in, in school, whether it be uh, high school, uh, junior high and everything. And so wrestling came easy for me. The only thing that I thought I might have made a mistake on because I was teaching school and coaching football. And, and I had a nice little contract for $10,000 a year and my first payoff in wrestling was $9. I thought, yeah, that might have been a mistake. <laughs> right, right. What was your relationship with uh, Jerry Lawler before you started wrestling together? We're first cousins. Uh, it's, you know, disputed reports on that. Uh, he was started wrestling uh, about four years, five years before I did. And uh, was over, had started to get over pretty strong in the Memphis area. And uh, my, my other cousin, Carl Fergie, was the first one to start uh, training after Lawler was already broken in. And, and here was two guys who never did any sports at all in school uh, in any way and had never been in any kind of enter entertainment. But yet they were in the wrestling business. Oh, well, here, I'm the athlete of the family. I, I, Maybe I'll try it. But I had friends in college that were hanging around the wrestling business right. and uh, uh, hanging around at the Mid-South Coliseum on Monday night and going out to the TV studio on Saturday. Big football players from uh, Memphis State. And uh, they started training. They, they kind of enticed me. I, I really didn't think about getting into wrestling until after I was in college. Right, right. What was the Memphis territory like? As far as travel and you know you learn. They had some. They had a couple long trips uh, up to Louisville, out of Memphis, was 400 miles, and and then you stay over and do Evansville, Indiana, and then it was 300 mile trip back down on the Memphis end. The trips weren't really really hard. It's just they did them every week. There was no break in in the action at all. Uh, but you know that's a testament to what the wrestling business really was all about. Was being able to go to a town every week with the same wrestlers. And, and, and able to sell these buildings out or do good good business. Mind you, we didn't make anything. I mean, the money was terrible. Uh, when I, like I said, I started, I wrestled Luthez three times. All three times I made $9, and that was up in the, out, they call them outlaw territories. I was working outlaw. Now they call independence or indies. <laughs> but uh, uh, 
I, I was there for a year before I ever came into Memphis at all. Right. So I had already had a year of wrestling under my belt. Uh, as far as the trips, I knew the trips were going to be bad. Uh, I mean, I would drive from, from Memphis, where I was living, up and, and teaching up to uh, Malden, Missouri. That was a hundred and something miles. I made nine dollars. It wasn't even enough to pay the gas or, or buy my beer. <laughs> now, you actually teamed with Larry Latham as uh, the Blonde Bombers, correct? Yeah. What are your memories of uh, teaming with him? It was good. Uh, Larry had been uh, had teamed with my cousin Carl Fergie in, in the uh, Mobile, Pensacola area. And, and they, they had closed that territory down, and Larry was kind of out of work and, and came along. We met each other. I was working in Pensacola and got sent to Tampa for a tag team tournament. And Larry was sent out of Atlanta down there because they needed a guy, and they needed two guys to go there and be a tag team. So I met they uh, Jerry Briscoe teamed Larry and myself up that night in Tampa for the tag team tournament. And uh, uh, so that's how we met. We both had blonde hair, and uh, we both were looking for some kind of break or some kind of work, and we ended up uh, uh, being a team there and, and staying on in uh, in Tampa for a while as a tag team, under underneath tag team. Right. Actually, one of the most famous matches that we've, we always talk about here in the office is the uh, concession stand brawl from uh, Tupelo. Yeah. Yeah, that, that kind of was the uh, starting point for ECW. That started all the hardcore. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. <clears throat> Excuse me when I tell them, uh, you know, I've been in hardcore. Some of these young guys, they see me out in the independent circuit and they say, oh, honky tonk man, you don't take any bumps anymore. You don't, well, I don't have to take any bumps anymore. I know how to work. I know what I need to do in the ring, so I really don't have to do all that nonsense these guys do. But still, then they they think and they look back and they see a scar here or a scar there and they said, well, man, you have done hardcore. And I said, brother, I created hardcore with that Tupelo concession stand match. And I was telling a young man the other day, Eddie Gilbert was a young boy breaking in. His dad was wrestling in the Memphis Territory when we did that Tupelo concession stand match. And Eddie just was in, he it just, I, obviously it made a lasting impact on him. So later on in his career, once he broke in, and I helped break Eddie in, uh, and he had a few matches, and he went on to different places, and he met up with... Uh, uh, Paul E. and a guy, Joel Goodhart, who, who scammed a whole bunch of people around Philadelphia, and uh, me included. Uh, he ended up then with Eddie Gilbert and doing, seeing that tape, and, and it, made, it, it created ECW. No matter what they say, ECW guys, are, they can dispute it if they want, but believe me, the Tupelo concession stand match has been duplicated and replayed in arenas around the world hundreds and hundreds of times. And it was, you know, that thing was put together spur of the moment. Jerry Jarrett uh, had uh, Robert Fuller and, and uh, Ron Fuller and those guys had a whole crew of people in Memphis, and they decided to leave and go to Knoxville. So Jerry Jarrett was left with no talent. He had myself. He had uh, Larry. Larry and I had just come in there from Tampa. Uh, he had Coco. He had uh, Lawler and Dundee and Ricky Martin and Robert Gibson. He virtually had no talent at all. Everyone these other guys just left and he came into Tupelo on a Friday night he said we're gonna have to do something we got to do something to kick this thing off everybody's left everybody's gone we got nothing going on here it's gonna die and he said let's just you guys go out and have a, a three fall tag match and he said Wayne you and Larry y'all beat Lawler and Dundee for the belts and then just y'all break it this tear this building up tear the whole place up we, we got to do something and that's how it was done. It was awesome. And we just did it that way. There was nothing else said about it. Just just tear the building up. At the time, did you think, wow, this match is going to be classic? Or, no, no. No, it was uh, it was just a, a, a one of those Pier 6 brawls that, that broke out. And then, you know, once you get in a concession stand, you're throwing all the food and the pots and the pans. And uh, it was really something to watch it back on TV and see it again. Now I look at it, it's, it was like great TV. This was really, really good stuff. And consequently, they showed it on Saturday morning. Monday night, it sold out at the Mid-South Coliseum. It was sold out, turned people away. Uh, mind you, I didn't make any money out of the deal, but that's beside the point. <laughs> you also teamed with uh, Tortanaka, correct? Uh, no. I was teamed with uh, David Schultz, Larry... Kevin Sullivan, Kevin Sullivan and I w w was in Memphis together with Jimmy Hart when Jimmy created the first family right. of wrestling. We were the actual first family with Chick Donovan, Kevin Sullivan, myself, uh, Danny Davis, Paul Ellering came in on that deal, and uh, a guy named Killer Carl Krupp. <laughs> right, German.
What are your memories of teaming, or actually not teaming, but your matches with uh, Tommy Rich and Bill Dundee? Boy, those are classics. You know, I was in the ring with Tommy about a month ago, the first time, and I, I told somebody, I said, you know, it's the first time I've been in the ring with Tommy Rich in probably 15, 18 years. Right. But it's like riding a bicycle, you don't ever forget. I mean, Tommy's a great, uh, a great talent. He was over so strong. Uh, there, this was prior to me breaking in the wrestling business. Tommy was the number one babyface, probably in, probably in the world at that time. Uh, he was just a tremendous talent, and Dundee's very talented too. Uh, so we had good matches. Uh, I, I was trying to think last night when when Tommy and, and and Bill and we all wrestled against each other because Ricky Martin he came along at that point in time and he was Dundee's partner. We wrestled him, and like I said, Eddie Gilbert. Uh, so very very. Things that the young boys don't get to experience now. Two out of three tag matches that went three falls, 45-minute time limit. Sometimes you didn't go back to the locker room. Between falls, you just stayed there. It was a two-minute rest or, or, or something, and you, and, and, and you go back and you have this match. But during that course of time, whatever you did in the first fall, you couldn't duplicate in the second fall or the third fall. So right. you had to learn to do a lot of stuff. Now, mind you, I tell guys that, that I worked four matches in one night. How did you do that? Well, I worked three falls in the tag match, and normally I went out and either worked in the first or the second match and won a 20-minute Broadway, which means we went a draw for 20 minutes. So whatever you did in the 20-minute match, you couldn't go do in the tag match. So you had to learn a lot of stuff. Some of the young guys today, they don't know that. I mean, you, what can you do? You take a 20-minute high-flying match, this kid from California, I, I see him out there, and he for 20 minutes he does all these high spots and come back. And say, you didn't get a wrestling hold at all. He said, I don't know any wrestling holds. All I know is this high spot match. Well, what are you going to do if you go to Japan or you go to England or you go to Germany? I said, you've limited what you're going to be able to do because you don't know anything. I said, what if the first minute of your match, your opponent blows out his ankle or his knee or his shoulder or his neck, and now you have to get a hold on him because the promoter says, I want 20 minutes. Right. And if you don't give the promoter 20 minutes, I said, what if you're working on TV? What if it's a satellite hookup and you've got to have 20 minutes? You're the last match of the night. And now you can't do it because all you know is high spots. So these young guys have limited themselves that way. That's where we were fortunate when we broke in. We learned and had to learn a lot of stuff real, real fast. It's true. What are your uh, memories of Bobby Eaton, probably one of the greatest workers Bobby, I, I think, you know, my own personal opinion, Bobby's been overrated as that greatest worker of all time. Uh, to me, the great workers are the guys that can actually do a lot of stuff in the ring, not hurt anyone, not hurt themselves, and of course can talk and, and right. sell tickets. So, you know, when you put that, when you put it labeled that way, and then you compare certain guys and does Bobby meet that test? No. A good worker, yeah, uh, not hurt anyone in the ring, not hurt himself. Uh, very durable, very flexible as far as not being seriously injured himself. Uh, he, he, he worked really hard for less pay when he should have made more money. Right. That's the way I look at what Bobby did. We great, have... great to me, great workers are the guys that, 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 Total package. that can do it all and also demanded to be paid for their talents. <laughs> right. Now, were you there when Anita was there or did he come after you? Uh, Onita came after me. I was in Japan, and no, I was in Puerto Rico with Onita uh, for a year, and uh, then I went to Japan for Baba's office and came back, and Onita uh, was there with uh, Fuchi, and Tojo Yamamoto was their, their manager just for a short time. They left shortly after that. That's when I teamed with Kevin Sullivan and the first family came along. Okay. Now, how did you wind up in uh, Stu Hart's promotion up in Canada, Stampede? Oh, gosh, I wish I'd have never went there. <laughs> uh, I left Pensacola. David Schultz was in Pensacola. David and I were in Pensacola, and David had been to Calgary and had done uh, very good business for Stu, I guess. And had a, and at that point in time, the, the, the dollar was fairly equal to each other, Canadian dollar and American dollar, and David had a good guarantee, seven or eight hundred or a thousand dollars a week. So he had left Stu and came down to Pensacola and we were working there. And I was making four or five hundred a week in Pensacola, four days a week, living on the beach. I mean I was happy. Right. And then here David comes and then and, and Robert Fuller and Ron Fuller screwed him around. He always thought somebody was screwing him around. He thought he was getting screwed around so he decided to call Stu and leave and of course, David never liked to do anything alone. He liked to have someone with him. We had been in the car together for a year, two years, and 
back and forth and uh, he told me hey if you go to Calgary we can do this we'll do this angle with each other you come in as my partner turn on me I'll get you get a good guarantee and so I ended up leaving and, and going to Calgary and that's that's how that happened how was David what was David like was he cool or well yeah he was uh, great guy honest guy tell you the truth right up front if he looked at you and he said I like you you know, be my friend, you were a friend of his for life. If he looked at you and said, I don't like you, leave me alone, don't even mention my name, don't ever talk to me, that's what he meant. Hmm. He would never go behind your back and say, I don't like that guy, man. you know, this guy's, a, you know, he does this, he does that, I don't mind. He would tell you right to your face, I don't like you, don't talk about me, I heard you've been talking, don't talk about me, don't sit in my chair, this is, you know. He was very straightforward and upfront. He dealt with the promoters that way. Promoters do not like people who would stand up in that fashion and, and uh, I picked up some bad habits from David that happened to be one of them is bitching and pissing and moaning about my money all the time and right. promoters don't like to hear that what were your early impressions of uh, Stu Hart oh gosh the very early impression was Stu told me on the phone my guarantee what my guarantee was gonna be in the first week I got there and got my check it was four hundred dollars off that guarantee so my first impression was uh, he and I went in the shower room and had a big uh, argument right. that uh, uh, ended up with me trying to walk out and then I, I, I did start to, I walked out and left and got in the car and took off and then he called me back but Stu was a uh, a real businessman he understood the wrestling business he came along in, in real real tough times himself a boxer and a wrestler and all-around athlete and just to survive in that territory with the extreme conditions of the weather in the winter time, it is a testament to anyone who can go there. I, I've had guys, uh, you know, said, you were in Calgary. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I was there. Well, how long were you there? I was there two months. Two months. You didn't learn anything. It was summer or winter. I was there in the summer. Ah, that was a vacation. Huh. The guy that goes there and stays for a year, two years, three years, five years, like Davey Boy and Dynamite and Brett and uh, Jim and, uh, and all those guys that came through there, everyone who went there, and stayed for a long time. There, there is a fraternity, a camaraderie between those guys. It's, it's a bond between guys that went and stayed in Calgary. That's like no other territory, right. no other place. Just There's, the, there is a professional respect for guys that went and stayed there. I, I mean, I must have been glutting for punishment. Or I loved aggravation. I, I not only did it once, I went back and did it again. <laughs> I couldn't get enough the first time. No, he tried to get me there. He tried to get me down in the in the dungeon. But uh, Stu knew that he needed a, a mixture of wrestling and show business. And I was the guy that did the show business there. Right. And he liked that. And, and Stu and I have had a great relationship. Had a great relationship with all the sons up there, every one of them. Uh, you know, sometimes I talk about Brett and Brett's attitude and not ever wanting to lose in Canada. Brett never wanted to lose anywhere, whether it be in Canada or anywhere else. But uh, uh, they were all good guys. There's a respect there with us uh, because we were there and we suffered through together. That'll never be broken. That bond's great. Your memories of working with Dynamite? Very talented for a, for a guy his size that, that had to struggle to... to actually put on weight and to be big enough to make it in a big man's business uh, he was the creator of all the outside aerial stuff uh, you know Jimmy Snooker I, well I can't really say that Dynamite created because Snooker was long before him and Jimmy did the stuff off the top but Jimmy kept all his stuff in the ring Dynamite Kid was one of the first guys who ever did the stuff that would dive out in the crowd or outside and, and, and another guy that beat himself to death destroyed his body working in England and Japan and in Calgary for not very much money. Uh, turned out to be a very bitter person he did toward the end. Uh, multiple injuries and, 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 and you know, recreational uh, uh, substances that he might have used later on in life created a lot of problems for him. All right. Did you ever have any problems with him at all? Because I was reading his book and he wrote something about Well, he, there was... I think he misunderstood or somebody had stirred it, what we say stir shit. Somebody had stirred some in the, in the locker room somewhere uh, that I said I had paid the boys rent one night because the Boston Garden was sold out and I'd wrestled somebody and it was sold out. I was in the shower room and was showering and told Jimmy Hart, I said, it's a great house out there. And he said, yeah, it sure was. I said, well, that'll help pay my rent. 
Well, somebody went and said I was in there bragging about paying the boys' rent. So Dynamite took exception of that. And uh, then there was jokes made about Harley Race with his bag on his side because Harley had had the, uh, what is it, colostomy or something, the bag was on the side. And Bobby Heenan was making all the, all, all the jokes that, hey, you can't give, uh, can't give Harley Race the uh, atomic drop anymore, you know, and break his shit bag and everything. But uh, those kind of things, and somebody stirred that pot. Dynamite was in one of his moods where he'd get in those drinking moods and he would take all of the narcotics and the uppers and the downers and hard guy to deal with. And just one night he came along and started screaming and cursing at me for no reason. Obviously that was the reason. He didn't like me making jokes about Harley Race. Right. <clears throat> Did but you now I have to say, well, look at him. You know, there's no joke when... Uh, when Jacques Rougeau knocked his fucking front teeth out. So I lost a lot of respect for Dynamite over that because he never came to me and said, hey, what's going on? What was the deal about that? He never asked me. He just, he wanted to make a scene in front of everyone. Right. Did you work at all with Ben while he was there or he didn't even start in the business? He, I had a few matches with him, myself and Rotten Ron Starr. We were a tag team guys there and Chris was just breaking in. You know, it's it's told a lot of the stories going around that Chris was broke in in the dungeon and the Hearts trained him. They they didn't train him. He was trained by the promoter had had a son in Edmonton that helped promote with Stu as partners with Stu in Edmonton, and, and that particular guy uh, they were a tag team. It was Mike and the Mike and the mechanic. I forget his last name, but they trained Chris in Edmonton. Chris was already pretty pretty well trained when he came into Calgary. Another very good talent. The only problem is uh, interviews, right. interviews and size, right. interviews and size. I, I tell a lot. It's too bad, but this is a big man business. If you're not over six foot tall, it's very difficult to make it in the main event of the WWF because they have consistently over the years promoted big guys. It's just how it is. Uh, you're not going to make it in the NFL. Normally, in most circumstances, being under six foot tall. You're not going to make it in the NBA being under six foot tall. There's always the exception that's one guy here, that one guy there. But the overall thing, no. Right. Very seldom. The odds are really against a small guy, whether it be a, a Perry Saturn or a Chris Benoit or Dean Malenko or Dynamite Kid or, or any of those guys that came along that were smaller. Was there a place for junior heavyweights on the card? Sure, there's a place for a lot of guys on the card. But you can't have your whole card made up of, like WCW does nowadays in the year 2000, of, of all underneath small guys. It's just not going to sell. Um, what do you remember about Brett from those days? I mean, what was he like? Like always, Brett's never changed. He's still the same. Uh, most of us are still the same. We don't ever change. Uh, Brett's notorious for showing up late. He, he was, you know, that was the thing that he had told Bischoff one time. And, when Bischoff interviewed him for coming to WCW, uh, I do have one problem, I show up late. Brett will show up, I mean, if the show starts at 8 and he's in the main event and he's not going to go to the ring till 10, he'll show up at 9 or 9.30. I mean, it kind of puts a promoter in a, a situation, gosh, is a guy going to show up? Well, he always does show up, he never misses unless it's something extraordinary. Uh, hard worker, dedicated. Uh, he has one match worked out that works for him very well, and he does that same right, match over right. and over again, much like Ric Flair. Uh, uh, mind you, he can do a lot of stuff, but he, he, you know, he's at a point in his career where he didn't have to do a lot. He does the same match over and over. Very bland interview, I thought. He's always been that way. Most Canadian guys are that way. Uh, not a lot of expression. Brett never showed any expression, either in interviews or if a guy was stomping him in the head, he still had the same expression on his face. He was expressionless. Right. Uh, got a big push in the WWF for some reason that I don't know why. Uh, great tag team. They had a, the Hart Foundation thing was good. Brett by himself, he was okay. He did okay. The, the numbers of him doing sellout business like Hogan did or Bruno or superstar Billy Graham. You know, we'll leave that to the historians. Right, right. Now, what are your memories of working with Bad News? Good. He was, you know, he was another guy like Dr. D. David Schultz. Bad News would tell you if he didn't like you, if right. he didn't like you. Uh, if he said he liked you, he liked you. He he came to the WWF. I was with him, of course, in, 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 in uh, Calgary. Uh, another good talent that was not used properly. 
WWF apparently, from what I understand, uh, Mike Mann had promised Bad News to be the first black champion in the WWF, and it, it never happened. I think they missed the boat with that because at that point in time, with him doing the, the hand up in the air with the black glove like, right. like the, the guys did at the Olympics, uh, and for him to be the, the, uh, the Mandingo warrior type guy, the first black guy in history to, to beat the, uh, Hogan and, and be the WWF champion, I think they missed something in that. I really think the WWF missed a good spot for him. And I can't blame him for doing what he did. When he found out Piper got 50000 and he got 5000 or whatever the case was for the same match, and he went in to beat McMahon up, and McMahon ran and <laughs> locked himself in a room, I, I couldn't blame Allen for that. Right. Allen's a great guy. <laughs> now, how did you wind up getting into the World Wrestling Federation? I mean, when you left Stu Hart, were you champion at the time? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was the, uh, I don't know what they call it, North American Heavyweight Champion mm -hmm. up there. Brett and Jim, Dynamite and Davey had left the year before and gone to the WWF and uh, then Vince had made his, what we called his raid, where he went through and took all the top guys out of the territories uh, from, from all over the country the first year and he came through the second year and took more because business had, he had actually done what he thought he could do was go nationwide, worldwide with the WWF and put in the mainstream media and get mainstream media coverage. It had happened, things were really clicking, they were running two, three towns a night and they needed all this talent. So the second trip through was when uh, when I got picked up. Uh, I'm glad I did. I, I could have probably went in earlier. I just, I, I tell people, I didn't call the WWF and, and try to go there because I didn't think I was good enough. You know, you hear these guys saying now, yeah, I've been training for three months and I hope to get picked up by the WCW or WWF. You're three months in your training? I was 12 years and I didn't think I was still good enough to go there because I compared myself, I put myself in the, uh, to compare my talents with people like Bruno and superstar Billy Graham and the Valiant Brothers and, and, and all the greats that had been through the WWF. But then when they were going through and they were taking guys like my friend Terry Gibbs who works over at US Air now in Pittsburgh and he was there working and, 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 and of course Ricky Steamboat and Jimmy Snuka and Paul Arndahl from the Junkyard Dog and all these guys were getting picked up. Well, you know, I'd, I'd been with those guys for the last 12 years so when, when the opportunity came, I went. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, I have no regrets mm -hmm. about it. What were your early impressions of Vince? I always knew that he was a promoter. I knew that, no no matter what. He was he was management and I was talent. And there's a there's a difference. There'll always be a difference between that. You can never uh, be, you know, right beside your boss forever. I mean that goes without saying. You can look at at, at, at the list of guys who's been through there, who've been thought that Vince, you know, oh Vince really likes me. I'm his favorite. Okay. Sure you are, Brett. Sure you are a Hogan, sure you are a Piper, sure you are a Nash. The list goes on and on of guys that's not there anymore who thought, oh, Vince really likes me. Vince really likes you because at this point in time, he can use you as a piece of talent. And that's what you are. He's management, we're labor. I uh, always knew that. I knew he was a promoter. I knew that as long as I had something to offer him, he would use me. And if he felt like, <clears throat> promoters are, are funny people. We always characterize them this way. As they have us, we're the talent and we're a bunch of toys. And they play with us toys until they get tired of playing with that particular toy. They're like a small child. When he, when a small child gets tired of playing with that toy, he pushes it aside and goes on to another toy. Well, he doesn't really discard the toy yet. He might keep it around and go over in a toy box and pick it up and play with it again someday as Mike Mann has proved that he, he will do. He will bring guys back periodically and play with them again. Now, if he's playing with the toy and he screws it up and the spring gets too tight and it breaks and it gets all messed up, sometimes he'll try to fix it like a kid. He'll take it apart and work on it a little bit to try to fix those screwy uh, pieces of talent that might have gone haywire. But yet, sometimes the toy breaks and he says, the heck with them. You know, it's a case of my friend Jake Roberts, uh, you know, Jake had numerous opportunities there. Ended up, you know, with his nightlife carried over into his his daytime life and, and, and ended up going into uh, uh, situations where he had to be treated medically and clinically for, for certain things that he, he had done. But time and time again, Vince kept bringing Jake back and, you know, fixing that toy, 
putting him back together and let's play with him some more. But then there's some guys who might have done a lot lesser of things and they said, no, nah, get rid of him. He's gone. Hmm. So that's how I characterize it. And I knew that going in. I, I, I mean, I'll go to my grave always believing that because that's just how it is. It's a good analogy. Uh, you know, not only that, you know, he's just a thief in a custom-made suit. He steals <laughs> money like every promoter. Now, who came up with the uh, Honky Tonk Man? You steal money. <laughs> <laughs> who came up with the Honky Tonk Man gimmick? I did. I took it off a record from uh, Johnny Horton. Uh, Johnny Horton was a, a, a country country rock singer in the late 50s and early 60s, and he had a song, I'm a honky-tonk man. Right. So uh, I adopted it off of that particular song. I had long blonde hair and was spray paint the hair all different colors and it was all punked up and called myself punk rock Wayne Ferris back in the late 70s, way before anything punk rock had even... I mean, they talk about Frank Hickey, the spaceman Frank Hickey being before his time. Believe me, punk rock was way, way ahead of his time. Uh, been a, it would have been a perfect character for now, long blonde hair, spray painted, spikes sticking up all over. But that was just a takeoff of the music business. I've always believed that, that wrestling and music went together. Even though this was back before they even played music to somebody when they had an entrance theme, it was none of that when they, all this was going on. But I took a lot of my interview material off of certain songs and records that had been done on the radio because the, the, the things that were said, uh, the rhymes that were made in, in songs could play right into uh, uh, what you were saying on a, on a wrestling interview. Because if you're struck for words and you can't, and I, here's something good for young guys, you want to learn how to do an interview? Sit down and listen, not rap music and all that nonsense. Sit down and listen to some songs that you can really hear the words being said and pick those things up. And, and, and you know, I, I used to do one with Mean Gene Oakland, and I still do it sometimes. Someone has, you know, you catch a wave, you'll be sitting on top of the world. Well, that's a song from one of the, from one of the Jan and Dean uh, beach right. things, a uh, uh, surfer thing. Catch right. a wave, you're sitting on top of the world. You know, they might say, Hey, how do you get that little pompadour in your hair? Hey, brother, catch a wave, you'd be sitting on top of the world. That's, a, that's something off a song. So the whole Honky Tonk Man character came off a song. Uh, I had the sideburns, I had blonde hair, and I did a thing with Austin Idol in Pensacola where it was not... The old thing in the South was hair versus hair. Somebody gets a haircut and somebody gets their head shaved. Here I was with this long blonde hair. Idol had his blonde hair. I had the sideburns and the... I, I needed a change. The punk rock thing was dead. It was just wasn't happening. Nobody really understood what it was all about, uh, especially the redneck people. They didn't understand what a punk or punk rock was. So uh, in order to, in the wrestling business, you really have to be thinking in ways to keep yourself going and, and in a way for me to keep myself from dropping from the top of the card to the middle of the bottom of the card was to come up with an idea, and I came up with this idea and I was the, the Alabama heavyweight champion to go against Austin Idol, and the loser of the match has to have a hair dye match. There's not room here for two people with blonde hair. Right. I'm the only natural blonde. My hair is natural. Yours is bleached, it's yellow, it's all this nonsense. But anyway, we came up with a hair dye match, and then I lost the match and ended up dyeing my hair black. So I had the black hair. And some fans in Birmingham, Alabama came to me and said, uh, have you ever thought about doing an Elvis thing? I said, no, Bill Dundee does that in Memphis. I don't, you know, I never copy somebody else's gimmick. Well, we want to do something for you. Three months later, they showed up with a jumpsuit. Robert Fuller was the one who gave me the guitar, and that's how it started. Wow, cool. I like the idea about the uh, dye match. I never even heard of it. Yeah, the hair dye match. Oh, it was it was uniquely mm -hmm. different. It was, you know, the loser, and then and, and here Austin was, Austin Idol, he goes on TV, and he's got the, the manic and the styrofoam head like the, like right. uh, head, whatever, what's he? Uh, Al Snow. Al Snow, yeah. I couldn't think of Al's name, sorry. <laughs> but he puts the blonde wig on and he takes this spray can here of yellow. Maybe I'll do it green, maybe I'll do it orange, <laughs> maybe I'll do it black. So, and then the next week, we what we do is, it's, it's really something because we did it in every one of the towns, is I put the, the black stuff was a spray. 
and it would wash out. Right. So the next night, we had the same match in another town, <laughs> and I, I had my hair right. dyed in each one of those towns. So I made a good payday out of it because it sold some good tickets, and then I rinsed it out. But then on finally, after the last match, I go in and I dye the hair black, and I left a big blonde spot like Sputnik Monroe right in her front. So then, instead of being punk rock, Bob Armstrong and those guys in Pensacola started calling me skunk rock. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was as it went on then, and then I cut the hair, and, and I adopted a character that was Snyder off the old One Day at a Time show. This guy, Snyder, had the little pencil-thin mustache, the slick black hair. I put the t-shirt on, I put the cigarettes under the sleeve and rolled it up, and it was sort of like a real redneck character. Right. But then, like I said, these fans came along with a jumpsuit, and that's how the Elvis thing evolved. What was your relationship with uh, Hogan at the time? What was he like? Was I, he like? I met, when I met Hogan, we were in Pensacola uh, in about 78, 77, or 78. David Schultz and I were there together. That was the first time it, that, that we had gone down to Pensacola together. And Louis Tillette had was the booker in Tampa and brought Hogan up to Pensacola because uh, Mike Graham and those guys in Tampa didn't want to use Hogan. They didn't like him, didn't want him around. They didn't, they didn't, they were, Mike Graham was a little short guy, a small guy, and a lot of guys in Tampa were smaller guys. And Mike Graham, of course, his daddy was a promoter. He wanted to be the giant killer. And he was intimidated by a guy like Hogan, six foot six, solid 300 pound, you know, muscle guy. Uh, so Louis Tillette brought him up to Pensacola and they were, he was called uh, Terry, Terry Boulder. And his his brother that he brought along was Eddie Boulder, Brutus Beefcake. Right. But they came to Pensacola, uh, had an old Dodge van that would barely run. We put them in the car. We carried them around to the towns with us. They didn't have money. They didn't have uh, Beefcake. Uh, didn't didn't have wrestling boots. He used my wrestling boots. I would go work out with him. We would uh, early in the, we'd go early to the matches and work out with him in the ring and, and teach him. He was never trained by anyone. He was trained on the road by people. People just took him along and trained him. Uh, they shared an apartment with us. They didn't have an apartment. We took our bed, our mattress, and threw it on the floor. And one of us slept on the box springs and one slept on the mattress on the floor. That's what. That's how my relationship with Hogan was. And never asked for, I never asked for, you know, help me here, help me there. When he got a big break and, and uh, he was in Minneapolis and had a big break there. Uh, David ended up going from Calgary to Minneapolis. I stayed in, 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 actually in Vancouver. I went to Vancouver. I stayed there. David went to Minneapolis and did very well with Hogan and then went on to the WWF the first year with Hogan. I didn't. I never called and said, look, David, help me. You want to talk to Hogan? Bring me in. No, that. I always wanted to make, I always wanted to make it in, in the wrestling business on my own merits, on my own talent, on my own abilities without having to say, hey, you owe me. You know, I helped right. you. Pay me back. I, that was not the case, and, and I never did that. So uh, when when the opportunity came for me to go to the WWF, Hogan was instrumental in that because they came to Calgary. I was there. I saw. I worked on the show that night in Calgary. He talked to me. He said, "Hey, man, what have you been doing? How, why don't you come over and come with us?" You know, blah, blah, blah. David. Oh, he messed up. He slapped this guy. They had to fire him. And David went nuts. And I said. Well, I don't know. Uh, you think I could do good there? I mean, can I make any money there? Man, you make more than you ever made in your life. Go on, brother. You got to come here. So, uh, you know, I went. I never asked for anything from him while I was there. I went to the WCW because, hey, brother, come on. You got to help me in the WCW. I went there with no contract, with nothing. Didn't ask for anything. Then, you know, Bischoff was the one who promised a contract. And when it came down to do the job for Johnny B. Bad on national TV, well, I'm not doing a job for anyone unless I have the same kind of a deal that everyone else has. Bischoff didn't want to go for it, and then Hogan turned his back on me. Hey, brother, I can't help you. Well, if, if he couldn't help me, then nobody can. So I was going to ask you about that later, but... Uh, no, I can get into that more. Okay, we'll He's an old bald-headed son of a bitch. <laughs> so actually, Hogan's whole personality has changed over the years. Yeah, he... he, he uh, some way, opportunist, opportunist, that's what they call them, opportunist. Uh, what can you do for me now? And if you can't help me now, or if you can't do something for me tomorrow, then I don't need you today. 
probably picked that up from Vince, from being around Mike Mann, because the times that I knew him, prior to him being around Mike Mann so much, he wasn't like that. I think he probably picked that up. He was with Mike Mann for right beside him, around him all the time for six or eight years. And most of the guys that have been around, Shawn Michaels, uh, Helmsley now, probably has happened to The Rock. I hear his attitudes change. Uh, Austin, um, Bret Hart, all those guys that were around Mike Mann, Savage, all the time like that, they turned out to be, try to be the same way. Uh, I don't know what he, how he talks to him or what he does, what kind of mind control he has to make guys think that, that they should go out then and, and treat their partners or their friends or their compatriots in this business the way that they, some of those guys have done. Uh, I don't, we're not asking for a handout from anyone. This business is created on guys who was, if I started with Kevin Sullivan, he ended up being a booker in, 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 in the Mid-South Territory, and then his friend was uh, uh, Ted DiBiase and a junkyard dog and Paul Arndorf and the Honky Tonk Man and Jimmy Hart. Then when he got to be the booker, he brought his whole crew into that territory. It's much what I said earlier about Robert Fuller when he was booking in Memphis. He took his whole crew, which was Joe LaDuke, Fuji, Tanaka, the Mongolian Stomper and his brother and Jimmy Golda, and they all left as a group and, and went away. Each, each booker always had his group of guys he always brought in to wherever he went. And, and for some reason, Hogan never tried to keep his group together. And consequently, we've talked about this, myself, Greg Valentine, Jimmy Hart, a bunch of us. His downfall in the WCW was the fact that he never kept his group together that could solidify his power. Because when you're grouped together like that, you are a very powerful force. You're a union within right. a non-union organization because if the booker gets fired, normally all his friends that he brought in get fired too. But if the booker gets a new job, he brings all those people with him. Hogan only carried one guy with him, and that was, of course, Beefcake all the way through. Consequently, when the power struggles in the WCW that Hogan thought he could do on his own from just being educated through Mike Mann, it didn't work that way. There was too many forces pulling against him. But if he would have had the Greg Valentine, the Honky Tonk Man, the Superfly Snooker, the Bushwhackers, and Jimmy Hart, and all these people together as a group with him, that he, in the beginning, that's what he said he wanted. He wanted to make an impact, and he needed help, and he wanted to come into the WCW to make an impact and get away from that four horsemen, the Ric Flair. Believe me, Ric Flair has always had his group with him. It's the Arn Anderson and, 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 and whoever else that he has around at the very Wyndham's that has always been around Flair. When Flair was a booker, if Flair's got control, he had his group, believe me. And that group fought against Hogan. Hogan was by himself. Well, Hogan's a big, powerful guy in our business, in our industry, but there's some things that you can't overcome, and that's the one thing he did. He didn't keep his group together. He isolated all of us, and we all feel the same way about him. He was the guy who could have said, look, Eric, you promised Honky Tonk Man a contract. He came here for me. I never called WCW. All he had to say was, Eric, give the guy a contract. You promised him a contract. Give him a I didn't ask for a dollar figure on the contract. Just, I need to know if I'm going to have a job tomorrow. Right. That's all I was asking. Uh, but he, if, you know, if a guy can't stick for you on something like that, then he's not really with you. He's not really with you, so that's how I feel about it. I'll see him somewhere someday. Right. Somewhere, somehow, someday. You always cross paths with a guy. Now, how did you wind up getting paired with Jimmy Hart? Uh, Jimmy, of course, was in Memphis. Jimmy did the music thing, and, and, and Lawler, of course, wanted to be in music himself. He wanted to sing, so... Uh, he brought Jimmy Hart in to do him a, a singing uh, a Jerry Lawler in concert album or something, and Lawler's dressed like Tom Jones with a jumpsuit. <laughs> really bullshit. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, he brought Jimmy Hart in to manage, and Jimmy was there managing him and doing some stuff, and Jimmy was a real wrestling fan. Jimmy's got a really good brain and a mind for this business. No one takes him serious because he thinks he's just a, a songwriter and a music guy. That's a sad thing. He's been a wasted talent that nobody took advantage of, especially WCW. They could have used his talent. He gave Vince a lot of great ideas and different people were great. He had great ideas, really good stuff 
Jimmy still sees the wrestling business, and I think we we all should. You got to see this business as a mark. We're all marks. If we wouldn't march, we wouldn't be in here. If we wouldn't march, we wouldn't ever do this stuff. If we wouldn't march and we didn't like it, we'd have, we'd have been you know doing something. We'd have done. We'd had a job somewhere doing something. It, it, so. A lot of people thought, well, Jimmy Hart's just a mark. Jimmy's a mark. He, Jimmy was not a mark. Jimmy's very, very smart, very talented in the wrestling business. Jimmy helped incorporate, and this is where Jimmy and I got along because I would say on my interviews things from music, from songs in the 50s and 60s, and he'd pick right up on it because he knew that. Right, right. So our relationship kind of uh, matured and, 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 and grew together, and once he's through this first family of wrestling together, then uh, it was just a natural. It's too, you know, I, if I had known how to get in touch with Jimmy when when he went to the WWF the very first time I probably could have called him and could have went there with him and and, and started earlier in my career but the way things worked out it worked out for the best once again I, I uh, we don't talk a lot uh, Jimmy is very politically correct he he's not gonna go against the grain uh, he always would tell me please please don't say that be quiet be quiet don't say it and, and you know, if if I did say it, then he'd make sure to let people know that you know, that's him that said that, not me. So, but right. I don't mind that. He he's still a great talent. When uh when you first came into the WF, what was the locker room atmosphere like? It was a lot of tension there because we were the new guys coming in, and Piper and Orton and Orndorff and Morocco and and. Uh, all those guys could see that Vince was really making a big push now, and he was looking for new, fresh guys, younger, faster, stronger, and cheaper. Right. And we were younger, faster, stronger, and cheaper. Mm -hmm. and, and consequently, they knew that, that their days were probably going to be numbered, and in fact, a year later, all those guys were gone. Actually, I was going to ask you, was there a lot of competition against... The competition was so much more than it is today. Uh, I'm sure you somebody might say well he's wrong about it. no I'm not when you have guys like they do nowadays on a contract you're guaranteed three four five hundred thousand a million a million point two you got a guarantee that you're basically going if you show up you're gonna make this money well our guarantee was if there's people in the house and the gate receipts tonight you'll get paid so there was a struggle and there is a big discrepancy, even today, between the guys on the top of the card from what they make and the guys on the bottom of the card in the WWF. It's probably the biggest discrepancy. And I probably if you ask Superstar Graham or, or some of the guys, Bruno and some of the guys from years ago, they would probably say the same thing. If you're on the top of the card working against Hogan in Madison Square Garden, you're going to make six seven eight thousand dollar payoff that night if you're on the first match in madison square garden even though hogan's on top and it's sold out as a main event you're gonna make 300 right so there's a difference between 300 and eight thousand so you know it doesn't take einstein to figure this out it doesn't take the genius lanny poffo to figure this out where do you want to be down here at 300 or up here at seven, eight thousand a night. And that's the difference. I went to Madison Square Garden, worked a match against Bret Hart. I'd been in the garden, I'd sold the garden out, I think, seven times, uh, either with Jake or with Savage or with Steamboat or with Bruno. And, and each time on a sellout with, with, I was on top in the garden. I, and that was funny, I could never understand that. I made six or seven thousand dollars. With, with Savage, it was like six. With Bruno, it was seven. And with Steamboat, it was six. And with Jake, it was six. But if you work with Hogan, it sold out. You made eight. Well, it sold out. I mean, what's the difference? But getting back to the point, later on when I was, I was down in the card then, and I was not the WWF Intercontinental Champion anymore, and I worked the middle of the card match, and I worked against Brett at a Madison Square Garden show, I made 600, hmm. as opposed to a month before that, making 6,000. So crazy. now you see there's a greed and an envy and a backstabbing. You know, I didn't go to the WWF to fly around the country 300 days a year and be away from my young son and my young wife and, 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 and not make money. I had been 12 years in the business struggling. 
driving up and down the highways, you know, looking at the world through a windshield, making forty, fifty, sixty dollars a good night, a hundred dollar payoff. I didn't go to the WWF so that I could be support for Roddy Piper so he can make five hundred thousand a year and go out and pursue movies. I went there to knock his ass out of the saddle if I could. I wanted that main event spot, and I knew if I got a shot and I got a chance, I'd take it and I'd run with it. And consequently, I, I was able to get the shot. And the only reason I got the shot was because uh, Butch Reed went AWOL. Right. I mean, I came in, once again, kind of sucking hind tit. But I knew if I got the shot, I'd run with it. I had the most heat of anybody there uh, during that period of time. I, I was killing off. I was killing off the baby faces when I worked with them, or the heels. I was a baby. They brought me as a baby face. I was a baby face. Go out and work against the heels, or another, and, and, and just killing the heels. They were cheering. Every time the heel would hit me, they'd cheer. Kill him, kill that bastard. People just didn't like the Elvis character. I told Mac Man that at the beginning. Right. They probably wouldn't like it. But he saw merchandise. He, Vince sees, Vince McMahon sees the wrestling business totally different from the way anyone else sees it. He sees it like a Barnum and Bailey, a P.T. Barnum of a circus. He doesn't see the animals as animals. He sees those animals as an attraction. He sees those animals as something that can, you know, put a lot of money in his pocket somehow. Right. He sees merchandise. And that's what he saw, and he thought he could see little jumpsuits on kids and, <laughs> and the Elvis wigs and the sideburns. And he was really into the merchandise thing. He always has been. He's a great merchandiser. If he hadn't made it in the, in the wrestling business, I think he would have made it just in, in some kind of a merchandising or a product. Right, right. What was Roddy Piper like back in those days? Uh, I was never around Piper that much. I told somebody this the other night I was not around him that much. Uh, he didn't come in our locker rooms that much. We had three towns a night running, and there was three crews. And you know, now they say in the year 2000, oh gosh, wrestling business is bigger than it's ever been before. Stone Cold's over, bigger than anybody that rocks over, stronger than Hogan. Look, we ran three towns a night, major cities in the United States, 300 days a year. All three were sold out on a nightly basis. We just didn't go out on Friday night and put all 40 guys on one card at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. We had 15 guys on the card and it was sold out. There was 15 guys in Los Angeles and it was sold out. There was 15 more guys in Miami and it was sold out. Business is not as good today right. as it was back then. Right, right. Um, do you need to change tapes? Or? No, we're good for... Okay. I, I, I wasn't around Piper and those guys. Uh, I wasn't witness or privy to any of the substance abuse that was going on behind the scenes that everybody talked about. Yeah, them guys doing $5,000 a week in cocaine. I never saw any of that. I never saw it. I heard stories about it. Uh, I was never in the same hotels where they stayed. You know, I've got, when I came there, I ended up hooking up. Jimmy was with, with uh, Adrian Adonis and Orton and those guys for about that first year. I was kind of on my own, did my own thing and traveled with uh, uh, Gene Lewis, uh, cousin cousin Luke, Hillbilly cousin Luke. Uh, I uh, traveled a little bit with Hillbilly Jim and, 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 and Terry Gibbs and guys that I had known. And just, you know, lived a, I was underneath making $300 a night. I was not making 10000 a week, 15000 a week like those guys. Right, right. You know, so I didn't live the same lifestyle. I knew that this was a long-term investment that I had to make pay off because I was already in my 30s. I mean, how much longer can you go? Well, I'm still going. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you and Jerry Lawler have heat back in those days? Uh... I never talked to him. Once I left Memphis, I never talked to him anymore. I didn't have anything to say to him. He came to me. Uh, we had done the Tupelo concession stand match and did that angle that ran for that week. And uh, uh, had one of his teenage queens. You know, he's got this, I call him Chester the Molester Lawler. Everybody's got their problems, I guess. It just came to the forefront when he was accused of statutory raping some 14-year-old girl, which uh, I heard it cost several hundred thousand for him to get out of. Anyway, he had one of his young teenage queens that, around with him and we had that was we had done a Tupelo concession stand match and the week had run now and it'd been sell out every night everywhere, turned people away. Here he comes in, we're doing the interviews in the interview room at the Mid South Coliseum on Monday nights when they paid. Here he bops in, you know, he's coming over and he's gives her the check. Her name was Paula. Here, Paula, give him his check. She bops over and 
little bleach blonde that he's got, you know. He's got a problem with these young bleach blondes. Anyway, she gives me the check. I open it up. It's $999. He says, well, there you are. Your first $1,000 a week in the business. How about that? I said, it's not a thousand dollars. See, Paula, I told you he's not gonna. I told you he wouldn't. He wouldn't care. He's got something to say about it. He's not gonna care. So already he had a negative attitude about it. But yet he's bopping in there going, "Here, how does this make you feel? Your first thousand dollar week in the business. Well, it's not a thousand dollars. It's nine ninety nine. And I said, this every house we worked on was sold out. It should have been." twice as much. See, I knew he was going to complain. He don't appreciate anything. That's just how he is. He turned and walked away. Well, I stayed there another three, four, five months. Then never made another $1,000 check. Never made another $900 check. But yet the business was still sold out. And, and, and I, at that point, which the year before that when I was first breaking in there, she was, she would fill out the booking sheet. And I'd get my booking sheet. It'd have one town on it. It'd have Louisville, 400 miles, one way, $40. I'd go make the town, come back. I'd go to TV on Saturday. How come you wasn't in Tupelo on Friday? What do you mean? You were supposed to be there. Wasn't on my booking sheet. What's in my book right here? You know, who's playing the games now? Right. So now I'm missing town. So they booked me 400 miles, one way, 40 bucks. I couldn't ride with anyone because I was the only guy on the tour, so I had to drive by myself. But I went ahead because I was trained, shut your mouth, do what you're told to do. And I did that. So then, you know, finally I said, gosh, can I get just a few more bookings? Well, if you'll buy more outfits, if you get more masks. I'd go on the car, I was the Mask Marvel, the Spider-Man, <laughs> uh, you know, the Dingo Man, you name it. I was a guy under the mask. If there was four mask guys on the card, I was him. Put the, you know, buy a bodysuit, cover up so they don't know you. Buy more outfits, I'll book you more. Well, well you're making $40 and you're driving 800 mile round trip. How in the hell are you going to buy more outfits? Right, right. So, you know, there was a little bit of a problem there. He was in a position to, as a booker, once again, to solidify someone around him. You know, I would have stuck with him through thick and thin if he'd have stuck with me. But he didn't. And Jerry Jarrett, who, who, who's a pretty smart guy, uh, could see that that little conflict was going on. So Jerry Jarrett, when he would take over as the booker, boom, use me, use me good, treat me right, do everything good for me. Right. Uh, yeah, huh. yeah. And then when Lawler takes over the book, I'd leave. Right. You know, I couldn't couldn't work for him at all. So that was our relationship. When I came to the WWF, well, when I was in the WWF, I'd be home sometimes or, or, or I'd hear and I'd see... I'd see Lawler going on the TV and calling everybody in the WWF as queers and fags and dope addicts and they're all on steroids. He did the most bashing of anybody to the WWF product of all time. And to think that Vince would bring him into the WWF, he sued the WWF over the name The King. He held up the gate receipts in a lot of the towns. He put injunctions on the WWF for gate receipts where Harley Race was there as The King. Uh, the king of wrestling. So that all had to be, what a big mess it was. He, We ran the Mid-South Coliseum the first time WWF, WWF came there. Uh, just so happens, the five, just prior to the 5 o'clock news coming on, the strongest station in Memphis where he had his wrestling show, there was a grease fire in the Coliseum, and they broke into the news. Breaking story, there's a fire at the Mid-South Coliseum. Now what do the wrestling fans think? There's a fire at the Coliseum, we better not go. Uh, Right. Never proved that he had anything to do with it, but still, I came to the WWF, and then I never thought he'd do anything there. He didn't. He never got over. I came there. We didn't have anything to say. I still got nothing to say to him. I got nothing to say to him. It's about him. Unless now you get him to open up and okay. tell you what they're really like. You ne you never know who, what people do, or what shit goes on behind the scenes. You know what, what we're telling, what we can sit here and tell you about the locker room. Like, it's like a hawk. Now a hawk can tell you some stories that I don't know because he was privy to more of it. I don't know if he told you the story about him sitting there with telling Vince about go, Vince chasing little boys and all that stuff. But he did that. It was the last time he was there before he had this, this last segment. He had a big argument. But there's been so many. 
big arguments and things that happen. I, I'm watching the WWF Raw one night, and I see McMahon, and he's sitting there. He says, Austin, I'm going to tell you, if you want this belt, you come and get it. It'll be on the mantle over my fireplace. Well, about 10 years ago, if I'd had a tape of the conversation with my wife, I said, I can't believe that. That's the same thing you told him 10 years ago. He had taken something that I told him, and he used it in an interview for himself. Now, he obviously liked what I said, right. or it made some impression upon him that he later used it. And I told him, because I had I had left the WWF and had the belt. Right. I wasn't going to put Savage over on the Friday night that. main event. Right. I had left and went home. And I called there, got him on the phone, and then we started talking, and that's what I told him about the belt. I told him, I said, if you want to, I said, I'll drop the belt to two people. I'll drop it to Hogan because he's my friend. I thought, he's my friend. Exactly what I said, he's my friend. He helped bring me to the WWF, and I'll drop it to him or I'll drop it to you because it's your belt and you own it if you think you're man enough to beat me for it. I said, otherwise, it'll be on the mantle over my fireplace. <laughs> it's here in Memphis. If you want it, come and get it. And that's what I told him. And 10 years later, if somebody looks back in the archives and you see the thing, he said, Austin, if you want this belt, you come and get it. If you think you're man enough, it'll be on the mantle over my fireplace. So that's what I told him. And he used it later on. I, I thought that was quite nice. What was your problem with uh, Randy Savage as far as dropping the there, belt? There was not a problem with, with Randy at all about dropping the belt. The problem was, like I said before, here it was now. I spent my 12 years, $40 a night, cutting my head with a razor blade, desecrating my flesh, you know, cutting with a blade. And, and, and here I am now doing sellout business all around the country, everywhere we went, sold out. Honky Tonk Man against Jake Roberts. Honky Tonk Man against Steamboat. Honky Tonk Man against Macho Man Randy Savage. This was sellout business everywhere we went. And in the midst of all that, they got this big show coming up on NBC that I think, you know, am I going to be part of? If I, I'm only going to have four matches, I'm Intercontinental Champion, I guess, yeah, I'll be part of it and, you know, make a decent payday because back then, those Saturday night main events, you got, if, if it's sold out, if it was Hartford Civic Center, it was sold out, you got 3,000 or 3,500 from the sellout crowd for being on the show and you got another 3,500 from NBC right. or from Dick Eversoft's company, so you got a $7,000 payoff, so everybody wanted to be on those shows. We figured the one with 30-something million people is going to be a good payday. And, of course, I wanted to be on I found I was going to be on against Savage and had a meeting over at the office. I go there, Jimmy Hart and myself, and Savage and Liz, and they had Liz, and she's over at Vince's house, and Savage had been over there, and they had the limousine pick him up, and Liz is coming later. She's in the whirlpool getting the work out and all this nonsense. Jimmy Hart and I, we drove in from somewhere in a rental car and barely got there, and, you know, cold and snow and everything going on over in Connecticut and sleeping in some cheap, <coughs> flea-bitten hotel that night trying to save money and the whole time we were there for the for the uh, uh, meeting at the office Mac Mann and Pat Patterson and, and Randy and Liz Randy then and Liz came later Mac Mann never looked at me neither did Patterson he had Savage over here on this end of the couch me and Jimmy over here I was here and Jimmy in a chair and him and Patterson over here they kept talking to Savage saying Randy this is gonna be the greatest thing we're gonna put a rocket on your ass and send you to the moon exact comment Jimmy Hart can verify this, even George Animal still, because he asked me one time. Every time he sees you, I'm going to put a rocket on your ass. <laughs> anyway, that's what he said. I'm going to put a rocket on your ass, Randy. I'm going to send you to the moon. Here's what we got planned, what we want to do on this show. Uh, you go out there, you got you guys set for about a 10-minute match. Randy, it's all you. I want you to do everything. Pat's going, Randy, you just take the whole match. Bing, 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 this spot, that spot, boom, boom, boom. When it comes time... When it comes time, Randy, you set Honky up, give him the, the big elbow, one, two, three, bring Liz in, put her up on your shoulder, serenade her around, you're the new Intercontinental Champion. See what I'm saying? Now, he says, put, keep this in mind, you bring Liz in, you put her on your shoulder, you serenade her around. Then he looks over at me and he says, 
he doesn't look at me, he looks at Jimmy. Jimmy? And, and at that point, Jimmy, you pull Honky out of the ring, and Honky, uh, you take him to the back, and he won't be seen again. Now, I just sat through all this, and I listened to him say, I won't be seen again. He's basically killing your career. Right. right. And he said, once I won't be seen again, I said, well, where does that leave me? We're going to rebuild you. We're right. going to rebuild you. Well, once again, being around my friend, Dr. D. David Schultz, <laughs> who influenced me a lot about promoters and their scheming, conniving, backstabbing, I knew there might be something more than him going to repackage me. Repackage me how? Back in the first match again with the genius Lanny Poffo and S.D. Jones and, 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 and the popcorn match with Tito Santana for 25 minutes every night? Uh-uh. That's not what I put in all this time and effort for. I never complained one minute about anything. That was the first time that I thought something's going on that I don't like. No matter if they put me on the last match every night and I never got food because all the restaurants were closed. No matter if I had the 6 o'clock flight in the morning and everybody else had the 11 o'clock flight. I never said a word. I felt like I've got this belt. Make the best of it. Make as much money as I can. Because when it's over, it's over. Consequently, I left that place and I just shook my head. I mean, that was it. We got up and left. And... uh I got over the phone. I said, Jimmy, just pull over here to the phone booth a minute. I got over the phone and called my wife. I said, you ain't going to believe this. He wants me to put Savage over right in the middle. And he said, I won't be seen or heard of again. He's going to repackage me. She said, well, that's, that's nonsense. I said, yeah. We're sold out in advance for the, next, for the next two weeks before this show. It's all sold out everywhere. They've already sold the tickets. Every place we're going already sold out. I said... I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I don't know. I just don't know. I said, I don't think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to walk. So we ended up, we worked in Hartford or New Haven that night. New Haven, I think it was, that night or Hartford, and then flew to Calgary to start a Canadian swing. And when I got to Calgary, I called uh, Jim Barnett from the WCW and told him. Got him on the phone right away. I mean, it was none of this nonsense. I had been trying to call McMahon for two days to tell him, you know, I'd like to meet with you, I'd like to talk to you about it. He wouldn't take my calls. You know, it was no Vince is in a meeting or I'll have him call you back. Never, never call me back, nothing. This went on for about two days. Finally, I said, hey, fuck this motherfucker. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm getting out of here. I'm taking this, I'm, I'm leaving. They're not killing me because I was real hot. I mean, I was hot property. So uh, I got the number for... Uh, I had Jim Barnett's number anyway. I called his office right away, told the girl, I said, this is Wayne, this is Honky Tonk Man, I'll speak to Mr. Barnett. Put me right on the phone. Told him what was going on. He told me, son, by all means, whatever you do, do not, do not do that job on national TV. And the next time you call here, you use your real name, okay? You know how many people have done the Jim Barnett impression on our shoes? <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Anyway, he was very smart. He said, the next time you call him, when you call me back, he said, I'll talk to, to Jimmy Crock. He said, Jimmy Crock's on vacation right now. He said, I'll call him and tell him. He said, uh, call me back, I think it was tomorrow. He said, call me back tomorrow morning, certain time. And he said, uh, use your real name. Because, see, the people in the office down there knew my you know, Scuttlebutt right. would have been, Honky Tonk Man, just call here. So, boom. There was all kind of uh, skullduggery going on between the two offices back then. You know, if little somebody called and tell Vince so-and-so call, or somebody from WCW uh, called, uh, somebody from WWF call and called WCW and says, hey, guess what, so-and-so just called here They're trying to leave you. So, he told me to make sure you use my real name. So, the next day when I called him, then it was, yeah, this is Wayne Ferris calling for Mr. Barnett. They put me right through, and they didn't know who it was, see. But, uh, yeah, they were ready to call me, bring me right down, and go to work there. And Jimmy Hart, now, Jimmy Hart, I would have left. I was going going to the to the WCW and going to Jimmy Crockett. They had set up a meeting for me. To, they were going to fly me to Bahamas and set up a deal and sign a contract and everything. And Jimmy Hart said, please, please don't do it. Give Vince the benefit of the doubt. At least call him and tell him that you've talked to Barnett. He said, he's going to find out. Believe me, somebody's going to tell him, and he's going to find out. Well, and I'm thinking, yeah, somebody's going to tell him. Who's going to tell him? 
Jimmy, you're going to tell him? Brother, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Well, you know he probably did it. So anyway, I called Mike Manning and told him. I called once again, twice, two times, and never took my call. Told Jack Lanz in Winnipeg. I said, listen, Jack, have you heard anything about this Friday night main event? No, I've got to work at a Why? I said, well, you know, Vince, uh, he wants me to drop the belt to Savage, and I've been trying to call Vince for the last two or three days, and I ain't been able to get in touch with him. Uh, he said, well, I'm going to be calling the office in a few minutes. Anything you want me to tell him? I said, yeah. You tell him if he don't call me back, if he don't talk to me, I'm leaving tomorrow and going home and taking a fucking belt with me. Two minutes later, the phone rang. In a cheap hotel in Winnipeg, McMahon found me. Huh. Just that quick. I guess we need to talk. I said, we ain't got anything to talk about. You did all the talking the other day over in the office. And I went ahead and told him everything I just said about how you bring me here, you set, you do all the conversation with them guys. I've done all this, I've done this, I've never complained. I ain't been busted for coke, I ain't been busted for nothing around here. You ain't got me in rehab. I've been a model employee since I came here and did everything I was supposed to do, except this. And that's when I told him if he wanted a fucking belt, he could come to Memphis and get it. What do they do? I forgot. Who they get? What happened? They ended up. We did. Uh, and I told him, I said, there's a million finishes out there, and doing the job in the middle ain't one of them. And he agreed there was a million finishes, and there is a million finishes out there. There's no reason to beat somebody right in the middle unless the guy's leaving the territory right. and you're done with him, and that's a deal you made with him. My deal with Vince McMahon was a handshake deal. Treat me good on TV, no jobs on TV. If you put me in a position, if you give me a chance to draw, and I draw, you pay me. If I don't draw anything, you don't owe me anything, and I'll leave. That's not a bad deal. And that was our handshake deal we had. It was all in a handshake, and I was the one that made it. Right. Treat me right on TV, no jobs on TV. If you give me a spot for me to draw, and I draw, all I ask is that you pay me. If I don't draw, you don't owe me anything. You don't even owe me a payday. If, it, if, it, if the house doesn't draw, fine. You didn't draw. I'm out of here. Fire me. I'm done. Right. That's that's a fair deal, but yet then he wanted to change the deal. Uh, what they ended up doing was, uh, gosh, how was it? We did a da da. How gosh, how did that finish go? We did a double count out or something. I think. Uh, I really don't remember that particular finish, but I do remember that it sent. It now changed the whole history of WrestleMania, because Ted DiBiase was promised the right. WWF heavyweight belt from Hulk Hogan and Savage was promised the intercontinental belt and the rocket on his ass to send him to the moon and now that I wasn't going to do this job Wrestlemania was all messed up so Wrestlemania was now turned into a a tournament that's Wrestlemania 4 I think yeah. Wrestlemania 4 was a tournament Savage won the tournament Put Liz on his shoulder, sashayed her around, just like they had said they wanted. Right. DiBiase didn't get to be the world's champion. I think he holds that against me. It's not personal. It was business. I hope Ted understands that. Uh, to this day, I think he realizes that I was the guy that kept him from getting the belt. At that point in time, they could have put it on him any other time he wanted to. Uh, they ended up then to satisfy Ted. They made him the million-dollar champion. Right. So, now was Jake scary to work with due to his problems back then? Because you worked with him, I guess, around WrestleMania three and stuff. Jake was fine. Uh, never had a problem with Jake. Jake's one of the better guys, other than Steamboat and Snuka, and uh, you know, the Ricky Martins and the Brad Armstrongs and the Tommy Riches. Uh, they rate right up there as the top guys in this business I've been in the ring with. No matter what Jake did after hours, no matter what Jake's abuses were. Uh, in the social sector, never interfered with his work as far as I was concerned. Uh, we had great matches. I enjoyed working with Jake. Still do. Work with Jake all the time. I had three or four matches this past year with Jake. What are your memories of Andre? He was very temperamental, uh, especially when he was drinking or in pain. His back was bothering him. He was very temperamental. If he liked you, once again, he was from the old school like David Schultz and like a, you know, a lot of other guys, if he liked you, he liked you. If he didn't like you, he told you he didn't like you. For some reason, he didn't like Jake. Huh. And he just hurt Jake all the time. For some reason, he didn't like John Studd. He hurt John Studd. He didn't like the Ultimate Warrior. He would, I, I say hurt him. He would just 
abuse him a little bit with his body, you know, step on Jake's hair and grab him by the arm and tell him to get up and try to pull him up while he's standing on his hair. And <laughs> <laughs> Just right. subtle little things that, that, that guys do. But uh, he was uh, always good to me. He loved uh, my boy. My, my son would be around uh, and he loved small children. And, and he was just crazy about my little boy, so he was okay with me. I knew when he was in one of his moods, I could tell. Right. He was all, he was happy in the locker room. You know, he was a guy that was bigger than life. He was he was as big or bigger than Hogan. He didn't have a private dressing room. He was bigger than Piper, and all those guys. But he he was one of the boys. He was a real good guy. First, he was a first class gentleman. Did you ever witness anything with Randy, the way you treat Elizabeth? Was he? Because I had done the interviews with other guys that said he was really paranoid that he'd lock her in a different room. Yeah, how about that now? Here you are, the macho man. Ooh, yeah! <laughs> you're the macho man, and you're sp macho man means you're macho, you know, manliness and all this. But yet, here was a guy who was so paranoid that somebody's after me. He's always looking over his shoulder that somebody was after him, and he wanted to make sure that nobody got near his woman. As if anybody cared about Liz. You know, I mean, the story's been floating around for years that what Liz was kind of run around with the boys in, uh, up in Lexington, uh, Kentucky, prior to Savage ever meeting her. And, uh, Savage had a fight with uh, Hustler Rip Rogers, and basically it all stemmed over the money from the, their promotion up there, and, and, and uh, Rip's got a lot of good stories too. Boy, he could he he could tell this one better. But he was the one who introduced her to Savage. She was she was like his rat, right? You know, and so but here Savage was very protective. No one's to see Liz. He'd lock her in the locker room. Uh, all he locked her in the locker room at where was this building? Poughkeepsie, New York. I guess it was yeah. downstairs in that basement. It wasn't even a locker room. It was like a, a, a ladies' bathroom or just a, a little a little room or storage room. Where Not even, two weeks ago. This, and it's unbelievable. I don't know if you went down in that basement. Yeah, yeah. If I went back in there, I could find the room where he would about. lock her. He'd lock her and leave her in there. Now, what if the place caught on fire? <laughs> you know, what if she got sick or something right. needed out? I mean, is this some paranoid freak? To this day, I made the most money in this business wrestling Savage. I made the biggest name for myself probably going in the angles against Savage with all the stuff we did. Right. And to this day, if he walked in this room right now, he would say, Ooh, honky don't man. And I'd look at him and go, Ooh, macho man. And that'd be it. A handshake, and that would be it. Mm -hmm. There would be no cordial conversation of any kind. And, and we worked together for a year straight. Back in those days, was there any pressure for you guys? Well, you did your steroids or anything, or? I don't know. It, it was there was pressure all the time for for everything. Uh, Were drugs out of control at all? Well, out of control means someone can't control it. Uh, was there a lot of drugs taken in moderation? Yeah. Was there a lot taken in excess? Yeah. Uh, steroids? Abuse to the max. Mm. Uh, no one was exempt from it. No one. I mean, if somebody said, oh, I'm natural, I'm not taking anything. Oh, please, come on. I see these young guys nowadays, you say, what are you taking? Oh, I'm not taking anything. Come on, I've been there, I know the whole story. I'm only, I'm not asking you because I'm a narc, I'm going to bust you because I'm a fed. I'm asking you because I'd like to know what guys are taking nowadays compared to what we were taking. Uh, that's, that's, that's something too. Uh, you know, I was subpoenaed to go there for the federal, uh, to be deposed. So I had to go there to be, to give a deposition. And, and, and I told these guys on the phone, I don't know, they spent all the taxpayer money. McMahon never told us to take steroids. He never insisted on us taking steroids. It wasn't in our contract for us to take steroids. Uh, it wasn't part of our job to take them. We did it because we wanted to. We did it before we ever came there. Uh, but I was to go there and give a deposition, and and uh, they were, would fly you there and pay your expenses. So when they told me that I needed to go, I said, uh, okay, I'll just get my own ticket. 
and because they'd reimburse you for everything. And I used one of Vince's unused tickets that I had kept, and it was seven hundred fifty dollars to fly there. Right. And the government gave me the seven hundred fifty dollars. I used his ticket to fly there and be deposed in a case against him. That's great. <laughs> That's great. But when it come time, when it come time for the trial, I was moving. It was, I was loading a U-Haul to leave to go to Phoenix from Memphis, and I got the call then from my lawyer, and from this uh, prosecutor, they wanted to subpoena me to court. Well, I didn't give them anything in a dep deposition to subpoena me for. Now I got my U-Haul loaded, and I'm moving to Phoenix, and the prosecutor said. He said, oh, you can make it. We'll have a subpoena for you in three days in Phoenix. I said, I can't make it to Phoenix in three days. It's 1,500 miles. I got my wife, my kids, and I got the U-Haul. He said, oh, you made longer trips than that. Now, this is a federal prosecutor <laughs> telling me that I made longer trips than that. Just put the pedal to the metal. He said, you can make it. We'll have a subpoena there for you, and you come in. We got you testifying the first day. Now, here's a federal prosecutor who wants me to endanger the life of my wife and two kids now so that I can get to Phoenix as fast as I can, so that I can get a subpoena, hmm. so I can go help him out in his case. What I did was I left a day sooner than the feds thought I was leaving Memphis. I didn't call anyone during that four-day trip to Phoenix that I made. It took four days to get there. It's like hiding out from someone. It's like don't call anybody. Is that car following us? Do they know it's us? Because I knew they were trying to serve me a subpoena, that the federal marshals were going to serve me. I hid the U-Haul, did everything I could, got everything put in storage, got dumped the U-Haul, caught a flight. Me and the family flew to Calgary, Canada, where I knew I was exempt from it. And do you know what those no-good bastards did? They called Calgary. They called my mother-in-law, they called my sister-in-law, and they said, this is the federal prosecutors, we have a warrant for his arrest. Yeah, because I evaded a, 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 a subpoena. Yeah. Did Mac Mann know that? I don't know if he did or not. Did he appreciate it? Probably not. If he did, he wouldn't have brought me in this last time and made an ass out of me. Do you think uh, he did that just to get you back for the total thing? or? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, I was one of those toys that he wasn't finished. He wanted to finally destroy this toy if he could. But, you know, he, he used me for his benefit in that. I used him for my own benefit. I went back there. I said, sure, I'll go back. What kind of contract? Well, there's no contract. I was the only guy in the locker room without a contract. Hmm. Again, same as WCW, but I didn't care. I'd used that. I was only there for the Monday nights anyway or the pay-per-views, and I used it just for publicity purposes to get me back on TV and get back to doing 120 shows a year that I do in the independent circuit. Right. Outlaws! <laughs> now, um, what are your memories of your matches with uh, Ricky Steamboat? Long 20-minute, 20 25-minute matches that were really, really good. Uh, everyone wanted to see... I was the kind of a heel, the bad guy that everyone wanted to see get beat. It didn't matter who beat me. And, and obviously I did my job when I see people now, they say, you know, when I was a kid growing up 10 years ago, I hated you. I hated you so bad. I just, I just wanted anybody to beat you. Obviously, I did my job. If I made people hate me and they bought a ticket to come and see someone beat me, they didn't care who it was. Oh, I just want him beat. I want someone to beat him. And that, that was the thing that I took pride in, that I was able to make everyone sitting out there in TV land buy a ticket to see me get beat. The sad part about myself and the steamboat thing was after I, I defeated Ricky and I got the belt because he wanted to take time off, was he dropped out of sight and didn't come back and work any matches with me. We could have done sellout, sellout business because he's a great baby fan. He's one of the best in the business. Right. One, he rates up there in, in the top ten guys. How about your uh, match with Beefcake at WrestleMania 4? Beefcake, uh... Not bad. We had a, a, a nice little run. Uh, everyone thought I would have been getting a haircut. And you know I would have, if they would offer me any money at all, I would have done the hair thing. And it would have been great. Right. I would have done it. And I think I could have gotten as much or more heat by coming back with Jimmy Hart with a tonic that he put on my hair and come back with a big fake wig. Right. <laughs> would have been great business. 
but they never offered me any kind of money. They never talked to me about money. And every interview I did that Mac Man was around, and he was in the interview rooms a lot of times, I made sure that I did the interview to let him know that the day that they cut the honky-tonk man's hair is the day that I'll be retired living on a lake. I let him know subtly through those interviews that don't even think about it. Right. Don't even think about it unless you're going to come with some kind of payday. Now, we go to the WrestleManias and we make, I think I made seven or $8,000 for that WrestleMania. And then you got Hogan in the main event of WrestleMania making one, two, three million dollars. Is there a discrepancy in pay? Come on. How about Ultimate Warrior? What was he like? Well, you know, gosh. <laughs> Holy Christ. Was he out there? Man, just, just protect yourself, brother. <laughs> I, I was going into the program with him. Uh, oh, Hercules was, had worked the program with him. And, and I hadn't seen it. I just heard about it because I was in the different towns back then. When they were bringing guys along, they probably put, they usually put the bring along guys in the sea town, the Scranton, Pennsylvanians, and the places like that. And, but they were working these matches, and I guess it was just deadly. I mean, they were just beating each other to death because Hercules, big strong guy, steroided up. Here's a warrior, steroided up. And taking, he was into amphetamines heavy, you know. Right. <laughs> So anyway, I go to Hercules and I say, Herc, I'm going to have to start working with this guy. How is he? Right. It's always important to find out how some guy is. How is he? He said, you're going to dread getting up in the morning. Dread getting up in the morning. He said, yep. Why is that? Because you know what you got to face that night. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You gotta be kidding me," he said. "Brother, just watch yourself." He said, "I don't know. You know how to work and everything. You can probably work with him. Me and him just went out there and beat the shit out of each other." <laughs> you know, Herc was a good worker. Right. <laughs> he tells me I know how to work. I said, "You know, it's you know how to work too." He said, "All we did is beat the shit out of each other. He's deadly." <laughs> Holy Christ, was he deadly. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. But you know, he, he uh, I was with him for about six months. All I, I, all I could do, I did, was protect myself, is I taught him to slow down and to relax. Rick Rude owes a debt of gratitude. He taught him actually how to work. Rick Rude took him. 20-minute matches every night, high spots, did a lot of stuff with him, and ended up having a really good match at a SummerSlam or one of those right, pay-per-views with him. And then he went on to work with Dino Bravo and then on with Hogan. And then worse turned out to be an okay worker now. Uh, he's lost, he lost some of that appeal, I think, to the crowd because for him to go out there and go 20 minutes is like putting Goldberg in the ring for 20 minutes. Right, so you want right. to see this guy do three minutes and the jackhammer. You want to see the warrior come in, dun, 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 shake right. the ropes, run, bing, 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 hit the guy, one, two, three. That's what you want to see. I think one of the biggest pops of all time, though, is when he came through the curtain at Madison Square Garden at the SummerSlam when I said, I don't care who's out here, I want to wrestle anybody. It doesn't matter to me. Bring out anybody. Nobody can beat me. And they hit his music, and that place went absolutely bananas. And he, he hit the ring, bing, 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 one, two. Give me the flying shoulder block, splash me one, two, three. It erupted. The place erupted. Uh, didn't regret doing that job at all because Vince had, did, was a businessman to me about that. Right. He told me six months ahead of time what he wanted, what he would like to do, where he was going. Hogan's wanting to do movies. Hogan's wanting to take time off. He said, you know I got to have the belt in the towns talking about the world right. champions. He, I said, I understand. He said, I know that this guy can't work a fucking lick, but he said, I want you to go out there. He said, just, he said, work with the guy in the front row. He said, I just need to get him over. I'm going to push him all the way. I said, I'll do it. 
came down to the match at Madison Square Garden. Uh, they asked for a finish. They said we need to get we need to get him over. How, how would how do you want to do it? And that to me is the way to treat a guy in this business. A young guy breaking in, you tell him, hey, go out there, shut your mouth, do the job. An older guy in the business, here's what we need to do. Here's why. How would you like to do it? Since I'm the one that's having to do it, let me have some input. And they asked me, and I said, I think it needs to be fast. The faster, the better. They said, okay. We put it together, and that's how we did it.